For these connecting points, you may feel free to share as much as you would like or just listen. And for the first one, I just wanted you all to maybe tell a story about a time, tell a story about a time when someone gave you some advice in a very challenging situation. Tell a story about a time when you received some, some helpful advice in a challenging situation. Take a few moments to do that. About 10 more seconds. Challenging situations and receiving some advice. Challenging situations. Well, in the name of Jesus, amen. I want to invite you to um, imagine yourself at a dinner party. Imagine yourself at a dinner party. You appreciate the fine taste and the decor of the home. Cocktails and sparkling conversation in the parlor precede the meal. Once the party moves into the dining room, though, everything suddenly halts and falls silent. You see, there is a horse, an actual horse, on the dining room table. It is an awkward moment as all the guests take their seats. The horse is not so big, as to interfere with the dinner, you can still reach around its legs and everything. However, it is certainly not so small to be ignored. The host and the hostess appear uncomfortable and almost desperate. They see the horse, and they are obviously embarrassed and at a loss to know what to do about this horse on the dining room table. They avoid mention of the horse, not wanting to impose their worries on the rest of the guests. And then the dinner guests themselves, we ourselves, not wanting to increase the host's discomfort, kind of avert our eyes and, and, and say little in fear of bringing up any conversation or any slip about this horse on the dining room table. The horse on the dining room table is actually a parable. It's a parable that I heard when I was taking a class at Palm Beach Community College, a class on death and dying. And in this parable, the horse is really meant to represent loss. It's meant to represent loss. A loss of, of any kind. A loss of life or a loss of a way of life. A loss of a job. A loss of your status. A, a loss of maybe some particular thing that you appreciate about life. That is the horse on the dining room table. 
The horse on the dining room table, Pastor Putnam, is also when your team loses the World Series. Also, a loss can be, well, your spouse leaving. Or maybe, Junko, your daughter leaving for college. Or loss can be a dear friend going to the cross. There's a passage I'm going to read you today about a time when God actually came to speak to his people about a particular horse in the dining room table. It was about his going to the cross. And in that particular moment, Jesus is showing that when we experience loss, when we encounter that horse on the dining room, dining room table, God comes to care for us. So I'd like to invite you to open up maybe your little pamphlet there you have on the table. Maybe even take a look at the screen. And I'm going to, to read this passage from Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, about a time when Jesus is about to deal with people who are broken and about to experience loss. And it says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, and you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus is telling them about a particular loss they're going to experience. And he's also telling them about the horse on the dining room table, that awkward thing that no one wants to discuss or even acknowledge. Peter, in this particular incident, is in denial. Everybody say it. Denial. Denial is a stage of grieving that the renowned psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross identifies as our way of dealing and coping with some kind of loss. Denial is a natural human response. It is, a, it is a, a mechanism by which we deal with and refuse to acknowledge that I or someone else can die. Denial is when we do like Peter and say, never, Lord, this will never happen to you. Or it is like when the serpent in the garden tells Adam and Eve when they go to eat the forbidden fruit, Oh, you will not surely die. Denial. Denial is the way that we deal with actual mortal death, but it is also the way that we de deal with the death that is sin. It is when we refuse to acknowledge our failings, refuse to acknowledge our addictions and our dirty habits. It is even what our society says that certain sins are just merely a alternative lifestyle. Denial is in any way in which we sort of pretend that we are somehow righteous when we were truly unrighteous, when we cover ourselves with the proverbial fig leaves to hide our nakedness. That is denial. That is denial of the death that is sin. But then there is also a denial that is of the death of hell. There's a sense in which we struggle with and actually deny the idea that a good God could ever condemn someone to a place of torment and suffering. It is what Jesus is saying is about to happen to him, that he is going to be killed. He is going to suffer, and he's going to die and also descend to hell. By our denying that there is death, that there is this suffering and torment, we also deny that Jesus Christ is the one who saves us from it. We deny that Jesus Christ is indeed our Savior. We deny that he is the Lord who comes to meet us when we are facing loss. Therefore, as we're at that dinner table, 
as we're there seated and there's that horse on the dining room table, the more we ignore the loss, the greater and greater it becomes. The more it comes to dominate our lives and take over everything. The horse grows, grows to the point that it's now pushing off the plates and the silverware and all the cups and the, and the meal off the table. It grows to the point in which the dinner is completely disrupted. But Jesus, our Lord and Savior, comes to us in those times and those moments when we are facing this untenable horse on the dining room table. He comes to meet us when we are, when we are being pushed out and pushed away by this thing that no one wants to talk about. And what does Jesus do when he finds us? Well, he doesn't ignore the horse. He actually points out the horse and acknowledges the horse. And he also acknowledges how we feel. He does three things that I want to, to bring out to you from the reading today. Three things. And the first thing is I just want to take a look again at, at uh, verse 21 of our reading there. And it says, um, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. It says that Jesus begins to explain. Everyone say explain. Explain. Jesus, I have this image of Jesus sitting down with his disciples and describing to them and helping them to understand and grasp what is about to happen. Jesus is caring and loving and he knows that in this world we are going to face serpents and death and all kinds of problems, but he wants to be there with us and walk us through it, take us through the process. Jesus doesn't deny that there's death, but he acknowledges it and talks about how he's even a victor over it, saying that he will rise from the dead. Jesus explains. He takes time to help us, the disciples, understand exactly what is about to happen. Jesus also does another thing. He also prophesies. To talk about this now is to say that Jesus knew the future. He knew what was coming, and he prophesied and shared it with his disciples. He let them know in advance what, what was coming. He let them know his, his power of knowledge and wisdom by the Holy Spirit of what was to have come in the future. Jesus explains, but he also prophesies. He tells us the future. He tells us what's coming. He tells us, although we may die in the future, he's also promising that we will rise again. And Jesus does the third thing here. Jesus also evangelizes. Everybody say evangelize. Evangelize merely means to share the good news. He tells the gospel narrative. The same gospel narrative that we also proclaim in wherever we say the creed. We talk about a Jesus who was born of the Virgin Mary, but then one who suffers under Pontius Pilate, is crucified and also who dies, is buried, but then rises again and also will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. Jesus tells his disciples that narrative as they are experiencing loss, as they are broken, he brings them the beautiful, glorious news of his death and resurrection. And we say in Scripture, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring us good news. Jesus explains when we're broken. He prophesies, and he tells us this good news. When we are broken, God makes that news beautiful by telling us the gospel. So at this party where we're at, where this horse is just growing and just getting in our way and getting in everybody's way, Jesus shows up. And when Jesus shows up and acknowledges that the horse is there, as we are hearing him talk about that and acknowledging it, suddenly that horse seems to get smaller and smaller and smaller to the point in which it's hardly even a problem anymore. Our attention is caught up in what Jesus is saying. Our attention is caught up as who is seated at the head of the table, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we come here, we are at a dinner party. Right here, we are seated at tables. And Jesus Christ shows up. He shows up in the word that we explain in our message, the prophecy that we give about our future in the Lord Jesus Christ coming, and in the good news that we proclaim to you of Jesus Christ's resurrection and victory over death. 
When Jesus comes, there is no more horse on the dining room table. Instead, we have a lamb on our table. The lamb who was slain. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Suddenly, there is no more room for any other thing on the table except for the body and blood of Christ and the wine and the bread. What the Lamb does is He pushes away all things, all hurting, all pain, and fills it with His presence, with His goodness, His mercy, and the promise of eternal life. Jesus Christ is on our table, and He fills it with all that He is. It is a foretaste of the feast to come when we're in heaven where Jesus will be at the center of everything and all elders, everyone will be bowing down, praising the Lamb of God who was slain, saying, worthy, worthy, worthy is Lord the God Almighty. Amen. Jesus Christ comes to our party. He fills our world, fills our life with the words of promises. So what should you do? When you find yourself facing loss, what should you do when you find that table, on that table, that horse, taking up all the space? Well, I say, confess. Confess your sins. Confess your faults with one another. Jesus promises that everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. So what should you do when you face loss? I say confess. Confess the creed. Confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior who suffered and died and rose again and will return again to claim all of us. When you confess your sins, you will be forgiven. When you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Jesus Christ is our Lamb who is present on our dining room table. When we are broken, he comes to make us and all that is beautiful. There is a particular trooper, a particular state trooper from a, a certain state in the United States who talked about the challenges of, of his work um, in doing law enforcement. He said one of the most challenging things he ever had to do was to do death notifications. Death notifications. He said that he says, it's really on the worst day of people's lives that I tend to interact with them. So this particular trooper talked about one incident when he had to inform a young lady that her husband was killed in a car crash. Now he said, you know, most troopers would probably come and um, they would probably never even leave the porch. They would, you know, give the information maybe through the screen door and run away. But he was saying that on this particular day, he felt compelled not to just stay on the porch, but to go inside with that young lady and to sit down and tell her what had happened. That a man driving the wrong way collided head-on with her husband, and he was killed. And while he was there, he tried to comfort the lady and even, even offered to call um, other folks and, and let them know what had happened. But while he was seated there, the young lady's son came out of the back room and into the room where they were seated, and he asked, what happened? And the trooper said, you know, a lot of guys would probably say, son, ask your mother. But he said, I couldn't tell a lie. I sat the boy down, and I explained it to him. That trooper reminds me a lot of Jesus Christ, how he doesn't just shout out to us from heaven afar, through a door, that we're going to die and that we're going to rise again. No, he walks into our lives. He walks into the space, and he tells it to us. He explains it to us personally, caring for us, reassuring us, prophesying, and telling us the good news. Now, I understand that the news of death, the sounds of loss, are a horrible sound for us, a, a very uncomfortable thing for us, and we struggle to acknowledge it. And as we do that, it takes over our lives. But we have a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who comes to us personally to proclaim to us the good news in the face of loss. He comes to us to make us who are broken in our loss, once again, beautiful, to restore to us that joy of salvation that comes from him. That's Jesus. 
that is our lamb on the dining room table. Today, we confess our sins as we go to him. Today, we confess that he is our Lord and Savior, and we are forgiven, and we are saved. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you, Father, that in our brokenness, as we hear about the loss, as we hear about other losses in our lives, you come to care for us. We thank you, Father, that you share with us your strong and reassuring word in times like that, and that you explain to us all that we're going to experience, including the resurrection to come. We also, Lord, thank you that we can confess you as our Lord and Savior, and by that name, all men, all people are saved. We give thanks for this in the name of the Lamb who was slain, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Another connecting point for you. At your tables, if you would just um, share about a time uh, when, uh, share about some ways in which you can show your concern for people's ex eternal needs. Not just their temporal ones, but their eternal needs. Take a few moments to talk about that. About five more seconds. Please stand with me for prayer. God, we give thanks to you for being a God who comes to care for us, a God who listens to us when we pray, a God who wipes our tears when we cry. We thank you, Father, for being with us in, at Trinity here in our ministry, being with all those who are sick and hurting, being with us as we call people into the ministry, and, and being with us, Lord, as we uh, bring into our family new members through confession and also, Lord, through a baptism. We thank you for being with us in all those ways and giving us words to pray. And together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have a lamb 
on our table. Receiving this lamb means that we also acknowledge and believe that in and with the bread and wine is Christ's true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and the strength to live a new life. This is a gift intended for Christians who are baptized and who believe in this lamb, our Lord and Savior. And now I invite you to hear what Jesus said on that wonderful day of Passover. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, this is my blood of a new testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And you may be seated, and now I'll invite the community assistants and band members to come forward. This morning, communion will be celebrated by a continuous dual line up the middle. We'll form a line here that you may receive and depart to that side. We'll form a line here that will receive and depart to that side. As you're prepared, please come forward. Take and eat the true body of Jesus Christ given for you.
stand. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Amen. And receive a blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.